none of those measurements put the amount of the pesticides that de is detected in the context of how much is harmful to us, which is the whole thing. Hit me, producer Potts. Okay, Dr. Sir, in your last video, you taught us there's no health difference in between eating organic foods and conventional foods. If you missed that video, I will link it for you here. So if you're watching this one and you missed the other one, please go watch the other one first. But the follow-up question I had is talking about the dirty dozen list from the environmental working group. That's something that I've always looked at when figuring out what produce to get conventional or organic. Um, but the information you shared in that video has now made me very suspicious about some information from the environmental working group because it just didn't seem to add up. So can you give us the lowdown on the dirty dozen? Yeah, it's meaningless. Um, and now that's coming from somebody who used to put a lot of stock into those lists who also used to shop according to the dirty dozen and the clean 15 list. Um, but over the last few years, as I've understood more about their methodology of what goes into that calculation and how flawed it is, um, it, in the end, um, there's no value in their lists whatsoever. And I will explain why, um, I'm going to quote the analysis from this paper, dietary exposure to pesticide residues from commodities alleged to contain the highest contamination levels by, uh, Carl Winter and Josh Katz, who are professors at UC Davis, um, this was published in 2011. Uh, so this is a examination of the environmental working group's methodology. And then uh, they actually, and I, I can quote some of the tables in here, they actually um, did the analysis properly, which is to consider dose. Um, and uh, it's, this is just a fascinating, a fascinating paper. It's uh, public open access. Um, so I highly recommend this read, but I will actually just quote from the study um, how the environmental working group's methodology works. So their methodology provides six separate indicators of contamination. The environmental working group, by the way, is also taking data from the USDA pesticide data program, which I know we talked a lot about their data in the previous video. So they don't have separate data. They're still using the USDA's pesticide surveillance uh, program, like biomonitoring program for their data. But what they do, instead of looking at those pesticide detections and how much is there relative to a chronic reference dose or an acceptable daily intake level, or even the no observed adverse effect level, what they're doing is they're looking at the percentage of samples that tested with detectable residues. Not how much is there, but how many were positive versus negative. So that positive could be a million or 10 million times lower than the acceptable daily intake level or the no observed adverse effect level. But if it's there, they go check, it's positive. They're looking at the percentage of samples with two or more pesticides detected. So how many of these strawberries had two or more still could be a million times lower than what we need to worry about but two or more positives, but basically how sensitive is the equipment that's looking for the pesticide residues. Uh, the average number of pesticides found on a single sample, not how much of each one, but how, how many uh, are there, positive or negative, still could be a million times lower than what we need to worry about. The average amount of all pesticides found, now remember we talked about in the previous video, that different pesticides have different acceptable daily intake or chronic reference doses set because different pesticides, like not all the pesticides that are used are harmful to human health, right? And some are harmful in like really, really high levels, some more moderate levels, like it, they're all different. Like how much is their total when you're not putting it into the context of which chemical you're talking about is ridiculous. And then they look at the maximum number of pesticides found on a single sample. So what is the, the one strawberry that had the, the most number of positives and the total number of pesticides found in all of the samples for that one commodity? So at no, none of those measurements put the amount 
of the pesticides that de is detected in the context of how much is harmful to us, which is the whole thing. That is the number one, like, first of all, logical thing to do. Like, oh, that there's some of this chemical on here. How much is there? How much is a problem? Okay, so what fraction that's there uh, compares to how much would be a problem, right? Like the, that is the most basic way to approach this evaluation, not in any of the, the math that the EWG does to rank the commodities. Then they just rank them all, right? So they put, put these numbers together. They just put them all on a spreadsheet and the top 12, they call the dirty dozen and the bottom 15, they call the clean 15. There's not a, there's, there's not a like, uh, if it meets this threshold, right? We put it on the clean or the dirty list. It's literally like they just, they rank them all by this math that is meaningless. And then uh, say, here's here's your dirty dozen list for the, the year and here's your clean 15 list for the year. So, so just, uh, uh, yeah. just a follow-up. So first of all, they're not even doing, the environmental working group doesn't actually do any testing themselves. They're just using the data from the USDA which is public I didn't data, know that. we can all download that. That is, that is something okay. we can all access. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so they're not doing their own testing. And they are, I guess the question that would like come to mind, but aren't, isn't any pesticides in our food bad though? Even though if it's a low amount, I mean, shouldn't we be just uh, trying to avoid them altogether? Like, how does that play into this then? No, so like as we covered in the previous video, we just because something that is potentially harmful is present in a food, it doesn't mean that the amount that is there is harmful. So we need to understand how much is in an apple or a strawberry of which pesticide residue we're actually even talking about. And then how much of that pesticide residue would be of concern to human health. And then like also we need to be comparing our other routes of exposure. How much of this food are we gonna eat? Where else are we gonna be exposed to this? And so for three quarters of the detections from the most recent USDA uh, PDP that I've seen an, a breakdown of this analysis for, which I think was 2021, uh, three quarters of the detections were a million times lower than the no observed adverse effect level. So they were a million times, a million decimal points, a million times lower than the point at which we know, even if we were exposed to that much every single day for weeks, months, or years, it's not going to cause any appreciable health harm. So the amount of pesticide residue that is on First of all, conventional versus organic is very similar because conventional is so low. The amount that is on conventional fruits and vegetables is so ridiculously low that it is not of concern. We want to keep biomonitoring and keep making sure that farms are in compliance. We want to make sure that things stay that way. But the reality is the incredibly tiny trace amounts that are there is well within our body's ability to to detoxify and is you know anywhere between 10 to a million times lower than the levels where we need to be even remotely concerned even with the acceptable daily intake level which has a safety factor applied so no conventional produce is completely safe and what the environmental working group is taking that data that shows just how incredibly safe conventional fruits and vegetables are is removing the context of dose, removing the most important part of understanding whether or not the pesticides in uh, the food supply are a problem, removing that context from the equation in order to create a list that is meaningless, that tells us, it tells us how sensitive the equipment is. It doesn't tell us like anything about how much pesticide is on those foods and whether that amount is a problem. That's like so frustrating. And also it just makes me feel like, why, why are they doing that? They're What's their, they're, they're, they're a lobby for organic farmers.
Interesting. Okay. So, but uh, just to play devil's advocate. Okay. So sure. they're a lobby group for organic farmers, but on the flip side, couldn't we say that, that the other side is just big food coming in and paying for the studies on the other side of it then? Well, the USDA or... is, is a, is the agency along with the FDA, depending on where we're talking about what, like what food we're talking about that is in charge for of like making sure that the food supply is safe and that they're the ones that are regulating how much pesticide can be used. On oh, and you crop. said the environmental working group it uses their data anyway. So yes. it's not so, like so the, the data is coming from yeah. the agency required for monitoring compliance to the rules. Uh, it is not coming from big food, right? Like this isn't big ag or big foods data. This is the agency required to make sure everybody is following the rules. And it's the same stuff that the on. environmental working group is using too. Yes. So that's interesting. Okay. That's fascinating. So what does that look like? It, like, let's say you are a person who eats a lot of fruits and vegetables. Let's say you're really good. Let's say you get all of your servings in. <laughs> let's say you eat a lot. Like, what does that look like practically? Like, do we, if someone is eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, should they still like choose the the clean 15 or the uh, the organic? No. How, what does I that mean, look like? I mean, if you're like? eating, okay. So um, let me go through some math to illustrate this point. So the answer is- That would be great. <laughs> no, you don't need to worry about it at all. So I'm going to, I'm going to quote uh, a little bit more from this study. They have a, a table for each of the dirty dozen that year where they looked at the top 10 pesticide residues on that um, like food. So I've got the table here in front of me for apples and then looked at how much lower the amount was than the chronic reference dose, all corrected for how much we would eat, right? So I do not know how to pronounce any of these chemical names. So feel free to mock me in the comments is what I'm saying. Uh, acetamiprid, 25,700 times lower than the amount we need to worry about. In like correcting for, you know, apples per kilogram of us per day. Azinfosmethyl, 1,020 times lower. Carbaryl, 126,000 times lower. Carbenzamine, 7,870 times lower. Diphenylamine, 208 times lower. Fenpropathrin, 14,700 times lower. Amidacloprid, I feel like I almost said that one correctly, 282,000 times lower. Ophenolphenol, 31,400 times lower. Phosmet, 6,670 times lower. Thiabenzidol, 787 times lower. And the reason why I picked this one to talk about is it was one of the like the lowest numbers of times lower than we need to worry about. So when you start to crunch those numbers, you can change those numbers into a how many servings of apples before a person of a certain size needs to worry about that amount of pesticides, right? That's like another way to it's like flip it out on his head. It's another way to say the same thing, right? So the amount of pesticides is 14,700 times lower than what I need to worry about, but there's multiple ones here. We want to consider all of them together. So what is the math? Like what, do, what do we need to worry about? And that's where uh, safefruitsandveggies.com, they have done this math for all of the commodities in the USDA uh, PDP. And they have, you can actually go and you can basically say, I am uh, you know, male or female or a child, like what do the math for a different average size person. But I have, uh, some numbers in front of me for a child that this is the math that safefruitsandveggies.com have done. So flipping this on its head, how many servings before the pesticide residues would, would equal the amount where we need to start worrying, right? That would equal the acceptable daily intake level or the chronic reference dose. 181 servings of strawberries, a child. So smaller body, right? So like smaller body means- Total uh, in their life term or? Per day. Oh. Per, per day, every day. Per day, every day, 181 servings of strawberries. But wait, then what? 
then yeah then the environmental working group uh, then it doesn't make any sense at yeah. all why are they even this is insane apple okay 340 apples medium apples per day but that's for a child for a child yeah for an adult it would be even more that's so well, that's what i'm saying that is 269 crazy. servings of grapes 309 servings of spinach 7441 servings of kale 2,303 servings of nectarines, 1,888 servings of peaches, 476 servings of cherries, 378 servings of tomatoes, 79 servings of bell peppers, 64 servings of pears, or 7,838 servings of celery. I feel like you've been I, now. Now I understand your how you started this video with like, it means nothing. Yeah. It You're right. It actually means nothing. And it's almost like it's, I'm almost, I'm actually pissed off. Yes. Because like, yes, you should be. How you many years be. did I spend following like how, that? How list? many extra hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars did I spend on organic? Right. A dirty dozen list for the years that I didn't realize this was their methodology. And I just trusted this you know consumer uh advocacy agency right uh which is sort of what they present themselves as i just trusted that there's experts over there that know what they're doing this is not how you quantify the health impact of contaminants pollutants additives right like you have to put it in the it context. It feels like they're dose. being really misleading. That's what it, it feels like very misleading information. I just don't know how they've been able to and do that without being checked. They have this whole section on their website about how like one of the most important, you know, health promoting uh, eating patterns is to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And that if you can't afford organic, you should buy conventional. But that is not how the dirty dozen list is like then taken, right? It's not just the environmental working groups communication, right? I, I don't think I've ever just seen them communicating the dirty dozen list. I think I've always seen it through the lens of a wellness influencer using it to fear monger, right? Walking a grocery right. store aisle and pointing out, this is on the dirty dozen, never buy this, right? So it's it's always other people. But when they put out their list of the, mm -hmm. the dirty dozen, the clean With 15, fanfare. they should include the data you just laid out here and the data that you laid out in the other well, video. It, the way it they're devising misleading. the list in the first place is is, is not scientific. Let me read right. you. Let me read you what these <laughs> scientists from UC Davis say. Okay. We conclude that one, exposures to the most commonly detected pesticides on the 12 commodities pose negligible risks to consumers. Two, substitution of organic forms of the 12 commodities for conventional forms does not result in any appreciable reduction of consumer risks. And three, methodology used by the environmental advocacy group to rank commodities with respect to pesticide risks lacks scientific credibility. Like that, by the way, that's how scientists give you like super burn. Like that is science. <laughs> that is scientist for that's the T girl. Uh, yeah, no. So like that is, that is about as, as mean as scientists get right. Lack scientific credibility. That's, that's, that's your nail in the coffin, man. That is, that is like the worst thing a scientist could tell you. All right. Well, thank you. I, I feel, um, I'm just getting ignore those lists from now on. They, you're right. They actually mean nothing. And if putting this information together with the information from your last video, along with the information that you did on the dose makes the poison, I think it just like solidifies that we actually don't have to worry about organic or conventional as it pertains to our own health. So I will make sure that all of those videos are linked so that you guys can find them easily. If you're watching this like me, maybe you stumbled on this video first, but they are three all right in a row. That, that this will be the one that has a lot of angry comments in it. Um, and Well, I'm angry, but I think a lot of people will be, I think when you this is me too. Like I I've been through this process with you a lot. So I'm, I'm an open-minded person because I've been through you, but like, if I was just hearing this from someone and I really had spent all this time and money and focus on it, 
I don't think I would cave as easily. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, sure, I also yeah, think people will be a little bit defensive, but nobody wants to feel like they fell for it. They've been. Like, nobody wants to feel yeah. like they were vulnerable to misinformation. And the fact is, we all were. You and I have already both said we used to follow the dirty dozen and clean 15 lists like yeah this is something i used to promote like i and i look i fell for it too right so you know please understand that you know this scientific breakdown and and part of my riled up is because this is misinformation i used to believe and so that's a why i care about putting out correct information and busting these myths um, because I, I really care about correcting the record on this and making sure that you don't feel that pressure to strain your food budget to buy foods that are no different uh, than the cheaper options that you could be buying instead, unless you have other, like if you have other reasons that you wanna buy organic, like that's valid too. If you care about farm worker safety and you have the money to buy organic, that's a, a valid thought process to go into this. If you want to support your local family farms and they happen to farm organically, like that's awesome. Like support local family farms. That is fantastic. Lowers your carbon footprint, like all the good, all the good stuff. Right. But I think the the reason why I'm tackling these topics that I know will make people upset. I know it's going to ruffle feathers is because these myths prey on our need for a scapegoat to explain our health problems or public health problems, that we want to have a big bad to point to, that we can say, this is all whatever, the big food's fault, big ag's fault, right? Like we, right. we, want, we want somebody to blame. And the fact is humans are incredibly biologically complex. There are many factors that control our health beyond diet and lifestyle and health related behaviors like whether or not you smoke or drink many many factors control our health that are beyond our control uh unfortunately chance is part of it right it's part of our health outcomes is is a rule of the dice right given a certain genetic predisposition and a certain level of you know uh environmental exposures to right the pollutants in the air versus you know of other uh, sources, uh, diet factors, lifestyle factors, social determinants of health, uh, access to quality medical care. And then we have on top of that a roll of the dice. Like it is, it is, it can be, we want to feel like it's, it's within our control, right? We want to feel like I just need to do this, this, and this, and I will guarantee myself good health. It also feeds into healthism, right? It feeds into the judgment of others that you have bad health. Uh, so instead of feeling sorry for you, I will judge you and say you deserved it because you must not be doing these hard things that I'm doing, right? Um, and so part of busting these myths is uncomfortable because we want that thing to blame. We want it to be, we want health to be a matter of personal responsibility, even though the data is very clear that 60-ish percent of health outcomes are things beyond our control. Only 40% of it is within our control. So it's not a matter of personal responsibility. Like, yes, you can, this isn't to say like, don't try to eat a health supporting diet or live an active lifestyle or get enough sleep. Like those things are really important, but they're 40% important, not 100% important. And so I, I, you know, I want to make sure that we are understanding what is worth the time, the effort, the money, and what isn't. It is worth the time, the effort, and the money to work on eating more fruits and vegetables regularly. It's not worth the time, the effort, or the money to make sure that all of those fruits and vegetables are organic. I couldn't end the video saying anything better. So we're gonna leave it there because that was perfect. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Sarah. Thank you.